So as Arvind said, I've been asked to talk this morning about clinical trials and focal therapy, particularly focusing on endpoints, designs, and at the end I'll give some updates for some recently completed RCTs and pilot RCTs. And it's largely to give us a bit of, to, to, to stimulate thought on how potentially we should design future trials. As surgeons, we've been, everyone in this room, we've been really, really good at doing stage one and stage two, single arm, sometimes multi-center studies, usually not randomized. And that's probably been the biggest issue here with focal therapy. We've never managed to get to stage three, which is that pivotal RCT that stops a lot of the debate around what we're doing. And this slide highlights the problem. Surgical trials are very complex. It's not just the treatment that is part of the intervention. It's everything else that came before it, the diagnostic pathways, and everything that comes after it. So they are difficult trials, and there's often problems with equipoise, both at clinician and patient level. And that table is quite old, and I suspect if we updated it, it would be two or three times that size. These are all the failed randomized control trials in prostate cancer comparing two different energies. And often they failed because the patient wasn't happy to accept a randomization. And that brings me to five questions. These are the things we need to ask when we're designing any trial. Who should we treat? And I went, generally speaking, these first three questions are quite easy for us to answer, I hope. So who should we treat? Most in this room would agree that it should be clinically significant cancer, however you define it, but generally speaking, that's gonna be intermediate risk disease. And I know we've touched upon whether we treat some high risk disease in this meeting, but the, most the least controversial aspect is intermediate risk disease. What is the intervention? Well, focal therapy, but there are questions, and, and, and Arvind mentioned this here. Do we, um, how do we put all of our how do we assess all these treatments? Do we do them as a, do we assume there's a class effect and bulk all of these various focal therapies together? Or do we treat them as individuals? So there is something there we do need to think about. Comparator, again, standard of care, which is generally speaking going to be some whole gland treatment, whether that's brachytherapy, which incidentally has no RCT, um, radiotherapy, surgery, or do we compare against ourselves, so different energies, whole glands versus partial ablation. But the two areas that I've been asked to talk about today are endpoints, what's an appropriate endpoint, and potential clinical trial design, and what's a feasible design. So looking at endpoints, Steve McLennan's group did a piece of work a few years back, and they did a, a form of consensus meeting which wasn't just involving doctors and clinicians, it had 105 patients. And together this group sought to determine what are the most appropriate endpoints for trials in localized prostate cancer. And unsurprisingly, survival came out top. There was, there was consensus that these should be our primary outcome measures, or, or, or could be a primary outcome measure. And the problem with this in intermediate risk disease, and actually in localized disease in general, is that we'll never be able to power a study for this outcome measure. This is our table of metastasis-free survival after focal therapy. And if you look, the, the curves are almost flat. You'd need extraordinarily long follow-up and vast numbers of patients to be able to show any meaningful difference, even non-inferiority for any survival outcome. But they did also pick up and have consensus on various intermediate outcome measures. So these are things such as local disease recurrence, um, uh, transitioning to salvage treatments, retreatments. And so there, there is a group of other outcome measures that we could potentially use to power a study. What I found quite surprising was that although everyone agreed functional outcomes were important, and this is often the reason why patients come to see us, they want to preserve function, they did not have consensus that this, these are appropriate outcome measures for a comparative trial in localized disease. The FDA also talks about endpoints. It's, it's a reasonably good document. Um, it's about, it talks about how you should investigate ablative devices, 
they say the study should be for a minimum of one year. We should assess safety and, and, and publish safety, so erectile dysfunction and continence. And they say the oncological outcome should be a composite of three things. The first one is a systematic and targeted biopsy. And really, it's the negative or positive infield biopsy rate that we should be quoting. But within the data, we should quote outfield results as well. And then use MRI and PSA, although neither is actually validated in the, in the post-ablation setting yet. But the biggest issue is that the aim of the document right at the beginning is this is to support marketing authorization. This is to get these, these energies into clinical practice, not to, not to truly confirm clinical effectiveness. And we have an issue. We've tried, we've, we've thought about this a lot on, on how do you design a trial. We've got various treatments out there, all with completely different endpoints that we use clinically. So for focal therapy, we could use PSA. There's no validated or externally validated outcome measure at the moment. MRI still needs a bit of work. Sen sensitivity probably isn't high enough. We could biopsy everyone, fair enough. Um, how do we take into account redos and second ablation? And then how do we compare this data to our other, other populations having prostatectomy and radiotherapy where we use biochemical failure? However you design a study using these endpoints, you will end up biasing one treatment or the other. And, and we've been publishing this outcome through our case series for quite, quite a while, and actually most, I think, are now in agreement that the, that, that the only outcome measure that probably applies to all three relatively fairly and is clinically applicable is some form of retreatment or salvage treatment-free survival. And we can use that for all of the three, three treatments. And then what about trial design? I use the word feasible here because that's key. We can design all sorts of trials, but often they're not going to be successful. So we need a feasible design. The classical head-to-head -head RCT is still considered probably one of the best designs. There are issues here around equipoise. A patient has to be happy to accept a random chance of two treatments, often two quite varying treatments. And that's been the issue with a lot of these, as I'll show in the future slides. But there are, as I mentioned, there are discussions on what we randomize to. We're using mixed arms for our radical treatments of both radiotherapy or surgery, and same with focal therapies. Do we bolt them all together? And this is just a design that I want to highlight. They haven't completed recruiting. It's for IRE, but it was a slightly different take on a randomized control trial. They used two parallel studies, so patients who are happy to choose between IRE and prostatectomy get, go into study one, and patients who would like IRE and radiotherapy and are happy for that randomization go into study two. So it was just a slightly different take on a randomized control trial. The other option, probably the easiest option we have is a preference-based cohort. This is not randomized. This is where patients and clinicians make their own decision on what they want, and we find some way of comparing groups. And we've been doing this. These are propensity scored analyses or some other form of prospective comparative study. Unfortunately, it's not level one evidence, but they are very easy to do. A, an upgrade to that design is called a preference-based RCT. And we all probably know the radicals RCT for salvage radiotherapy after prostatectomy, that was a preference-based RCT. Patients could choose which randomizations they accepted. The other one I've highlighted here is called preferred. I believe this is German. And you can see there's 11 different combinations of treatments the patient can accept randomization to. Sounds brilliant in practice, but what ends up happening is that each one of these combinations functions as a separate RCT. So your sample size is enormous. And I've done some sums to try and work out what we would do if we had focal therapy. And we're talking thousands and thousands of patients normally to allow all options. And here they had, they needed seven and, almost 7,500 patients, or over 7,500. So probably not feasible. A third design, which we haven't really utilized yet, and I know people are trying. We've done a pilot on this where we've managed to at least get patients to accept the first stage. And these are called cohort embedded RCTs. There are some methodological issues. There are actually some ethical issues around this sort of study as well. 
and basically all your patients accept being part of a cohort. And then we choose the randomizations within that cohort that can be a second stage. So we tell patients you have been randomized into treatment A or treatment B, but they're not upfront told you are making this decision. We're just telling them you have been randomized into the control arm or the treatment arm. And, and I, I think we will get a few of these trials coming through. They're, they're, we have this in other cancers. We just don't have it in prostate cancer yet. And it's a way of getting around a lot of the equipoise issues and difficulties in patients making a decision between multiple options. And that brings me on to four RCTs that have either completed the main phase or the pilot phase uh, for focal therapy. And, I, and this is largely to see how they did it and potentially what we could learn from them. The, the first ever RCT that we all probably know about and has been mentioned a few times at this meeting was the randomization between VTP um, and surveillance in patients with very low risk disease. And they did, it was a positive trial. They found a reduction in, in progression-free survival. They found a reduction in patients proceeding to salvage treatment. But unfortunately, because that patient population, that first question asked, who do we treat, was maybe appropriate for the time when they set up the study, but was no longer appropriate for when they published the study, it's essentially been discounted. And we've never really taken this data on into clinical practice, which is a shame because it was a positive RCT. The second, and, and Professor Hamdi's, I think he's gone back to the UK now, is the PART study. This is another they successfully completed feasibility study. They randomized 82 patients in their feasibility with intermediate risk disease to either partial ablation with HIFU or radical prostatectomy. They allowed repeat ablation, and their primary outcome was treatment failure, so proceeding essentially to, to whole gland treatments. And this is the slide that I find very interesting. And, and these, the numbers I'm mentioning here in relation to PART will come up again in the future. They had to approach 329 patients to, to recruit 87. Some didn't meet the inclusion criteria. But if you read through that list, particularly at the bottom end, most patients had already decided what they wanted. They did not have equipoise for the randomization, which is one of the issues we have with these sort of studies. And then after randomization, one in four patients who was randomized to radical treatment dropped out. They basically crossed over and said, I don't want this. I want HIFU in this case, which is a problem. And that one in four number is important. It will come up over and over again. And it's amazing how consistent that is across populations. And only one patient dropped out of the HIFU group. They weren't powered for this, but I'd argue if you look at the difference or the, or, the, or the magnitude of the effect, you probably they were probably were adequately powered. They can't publish oncological outcomes because they don't have them, but they did publish their functional outcomes. And they had a, 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 an incredible difference between prostatectomy that, um, and HIFU for both pad-free continence and erectile dysfunction. And I'd argue this was... We've kind of missed this. This was one of the first RCTs validating the functional outcomes that we're seeing. And again, if you look at the pad free rate, these numbers within randomized trials are much lower than we quote a lot of our patients from some of our series for prostatectomies. These are high volume centers. Another study you should look up is PACE, it was presented at ASCO GU this year. They showed exactly the same rate of pad free. It's amazing how consistent that number is 50, 60%. But they were successful, which is brilliant. And they've taken on board a lot of feedback from a lot of people in this room and a lot of advisors they've had. And they're now proceeding into phase two, and I believe they've already randomized their first patient. And they're gonna be randomizing between partial ablation, so either HIFU or IRE, or any radical treatment. So assuming there's a class effect for, for these various treatments. And so I think we've got to, as a community to try and support these sort of studies and hopefully they'll be successful. The next study is our study, Kronos, and I want to show you our experience and how our conclusions differed slightly, although the results were actually the same. So this was a study funded by our biggest charity in the UK, 
we set out to answer two questions. The first one was how does focal therapy compare to radical therapy in terms of progression-free survival? And the second one, to try and future-proof the study and try and get more information out there on, on how we can improve outcomes from focal therapy, we wanted to test whether neoadjuvant agents can improve outcomes. The hypothesis was that it'd be, focal therapies would be non-inferior to radical treatments at five years, and that using neoadjuvant agents would reduce the number of patients who develop recurrence, and thus need redo, and thus reduce progression. It was, again, a parallel RCT study design, patients with intermediate and very early high-risk prostate cancer. First randomization was head-to-head, -head, radical treatments. Again, um, all the radical treatments put together against focal therapy, this time cryo and HIFU. And the second randomization was designed initially, like Stampede, as a multi-arm, multi-stage study, where we could add various treatments in as we went along. And our starting treatments were finasteride, so 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, and biclutamide, which was an antiandrogen. And we chose these because they had some effect in the literature, but also they were relatively low cost at the time for us to be able to deliver this study. And our hypothesis was that these, these hormonal agents potentially can have an effect on the vasculature to improve some of the heat sink uh, that may be causing recurrence. It might cause tumor shrinkage which can help with our margins, help with delivery of treatments, and it might even help with some of this field effect that Professor Hamdi was talking about yesterday, where we might reduce out of field or marginal kind of satellite lesions and, and might even treat them. We completed the pilot. We approached 359 men and randomized 100. We probably the biggest problem for us here, and I, I with hindsight, you could look back and say, could we have done something differently? But we started this at the beginning of COVID, literally months before the pandemic started. And so we ended up having to adjust our sample size, particularly for that head-to-head -head radical treatment versus focal therapy randomization. I'll go back one slide, by the way. You've probably already read it, but it's at the bottom. Almost all the men had intermediate risk disease. 20% had at least in 4 plus 3. And this is the recruitment curve for for Kronos A. This blue line shows you when the pandemic started, so February, March uh, 2020. This was what we were hoping we would do. This was what the adjusted curve with a reduced sample size was, and this green line is what we actually achieved. We really struggled. We had 10 sites open for six months and some quite high volume sites, and we really struggled to recruit into this study. We, it, was, it was quite difficult. And it, and it wasn't just COVID. I was speaking to patients for an hour at a time, trying to express equipoise. And we did work around expressing equipoise with, our, uh, with the clinicians and with a qualitative group. And they would, in the end, just say, I just want whatever I want, usually focal, actually, because they're suitable for it. But it was a difficult study to recruit into. We had to approach 211, 171 declined, almost all of them because they said, look, I'd rather have focal therapy, and if I need to pick a trial, I'd rather be in Kronos B. Um, and then that same number, that one in four, patients randomized to radical treatment actually turned around and said, we don't want this after the randomization. And this time, rad and here, radical treatment was surgery or radiotherapy, and they still declined it. This was Kronos B. Again, COVID. Gray was the predicted curve, and actually this was quite an easy study to recruit to. Patients were quite happy to have some neoadjuvant treatments, not all of them, but most of them. And the green curve was well ahead of our target before COVID hit. There was, there was a serious impact on services, but we eventually met our target and actually recruited slightly more than target with only really four sites open for over six months. So we did quite well here. Almost most patients were accepting it. Some did decline, again, because they want to choose their treatment, fair enough. And some didn't want side effects from hormones, but it was a much easier study to recruit to, and no one refused their treatment. And we embedded from a completely independent group in another city, we'd embedded qualitative work. So this was interviews of patients who chose to go into the study, who didn't choose to go into the study, interviews of clinicians, nurses, to find out what could be done to try and improve recruitment. 
And the biggest barrier to the head-to-head randomization was that patients were prioritizing quality of life and were prepared to, to, to accept a lower potential life expectancy. So, uh, so they were prior, prioritizing quality of life over length of life. And that was quite powerful because it's quite difficult to, to get over that. It's very difficult to cross equipoise around treatments when that's what the patient's mindset is. Some of the, the facilitators were interestingly when we closed Kronos B, so they had no alternative. Randomized trials, and some patients are altruistic, they do want to go into clinical trials. So closing B did help. And discussing some of the equipoise around the data helped, but it, not enough to really improve recruitment. And in Kronos B, probably the biggest barrier we found, so this is the neoadjuvant treatment study, was that they didn't want side effects, which is fair enough. They've come in the first place to see us because they don't want side effects. So potentially they didn't want side effects from hormones. But they did accept the study. And so we made a slightly different decision. And I, I wish we could go back and if the pandemic wasn't there, how we would have done. But we felt it was just not feasible for us to continue with Kronos A. It would have taken a lot of money, a lot of funding, extraordinarily long time to be able to deliver that RCT with 80 plus percent of patients refusing to even consider the study and then one in four dropping out of the radical treatment arms. The numbers just don't quite work. Um, we felt Kronos B was feasible. And so we thought, well, we'll take this for further funding. But as with all things in, in research, it's not always straightforward. We went back to the same funder. And this time they turned around and said to us, oh, well, I know we, we, we allowed you to use these treatments, but we don't think three months is, <laughs> you'll have enough of an effect over three months to prove any outcome. So can you change it? So we have. So we, we're using that pilot data to, accept that, to, to, to show that patients can accept randomization. We're now going to run a two-arm, double-blind, placebo-controlled RCT of three months of neoadjuvant apalutamide, which should have enough benefit um, against placebo. We'll need 640 patients, um, and the study will last about five years. So we're just waiting to hear. It'll take a little while for these things to, to go through, whether we, can, um, whether we have approval to do this and the funding to do this. And then the final study I want to talk about is FARP. These slides are courtesy of Edward Bacco. It's been, he's, he's been he's really kindly sent them over to me. And this is a completed randomized control trial in focal therapy. Randomized one-to-one -one focal ablation to radical prostatectomy. Used a, um, he recruited patients with intermediate risk disease and he used both Tulsa and HIFU, it was, I think it was the, the focal one device based on tumor location. The primary outcome was going to be uh, treatment failure and it was a non-inferiority design and they needed 200 patients. Secondary outcomes were functional and adverse events. And they randomized 213 patients to the focal therapy arm and to the radical prostatectomy arm. But if you look at the box on the right, <laughs> It's exactly that same number again. Different country, different population, you'd assume. One in four are refusing to accept their allocated randomization within the radical arm. And it's interesting. I'm sure we need to do a little bit of work on this because that number is just across the board. It shows you how, how little equipoise patients probably have between these two treatments. And it meant that in the end, 129 had focal because the vast majority crossed over and 76 had radical prostatectomy. Uh, the two groups were adequately matched for all parameters. Um, I wouldn't look at failure, but if you look at salvage treatment-free survival, same number of patients ended up having salvage treatment, but this is an interim analysis, very early data. Uh, three patients needed a repeat HIFU procedure. And again, this was the big slide I showed in the balloon debate. Big difference in functional outcomes. Again, validating what we've all been seeing um, between focal treatments and radical prostatectomy. So we have level one data that we can show patients about our functional outcomes. And they concluded that focal ablation is good oncological efficacy, preserves functional function, but this crossover of almost one in four is a problem. And it shows that patients probably have preference towards the, the least invasive option or the less invasive option. So my final two slides, what did we learn? Um, well, as I said, we have 
some level one evidence now validating outcomes. But really, there are a lot of challenges in designing and delivering trials in focal therapy. Recruitment is often difficult. Only about one in four, one in five patients even accepts coming into the study. And then there's potentially significant lack of equipoise when one in four subsequently refuse their allocated treatment. And this all has to be accounted for uh, and worked on when we're delivering a study or anyone in the room is delivering a future trial. But why? It's probably due to the fact that focal therapy is available outside of a clinical trial. And this is a problem with surgical trials in particular. To be able to offer something within a randomized setting, it's taking you a long time to get the experience, the knowledge, and the data to be able to do it. And by this point, by that point, most people are able to offer it outside of a clinical trial, which means a patient has no reason to accept a randomization when they can essentially choose their treatment. So it's probably the biggest issue and why we're struggling to deliver these sort of studies. Had we done them earlier on, we may have got worse results because we didn't have the experience we now have on patient selection and, and, and delivery of treatments. But we are now at that point where it's getting more and more difficult to do this. We shouldn't stop, but we just need to account for this. And then potentially, what do we do with expert and high-volume centers? These are the ones that are usually going to be driving out-of-trial treatments. And, and we potentially should look at some form of alternative way of delivering these studies. It's just one suggestion. It's not the only suggestion. But actually, we probably remove the randomization and the counseling away from the expert centers. Feel we know what we're doing, but actually we probably have an inherent bias in how we counsel patients. Patients come to us with inherent bias. So maybe just remove it. Take it to the, to the smaller hospitals, the referring hospitals. Get them to counsel. Get them to randomize. But we do the treatments. Because the biggest issue with, with focal therapy adoption, in my opinion, will be a lot of new centers with very little experience offering treatments within randomized controlled trials and getting bad results. At least let the expert centers do the treatment, but potentially use our referring sites for the recruitment. And that's, that's it. Thank you. Um, please drop me an email or call. It's a UK number if you want to have a chat. Th thanks, Tim, for a great summary. Now, you, you mentioned over and over again the challenge in being able to maintain equipoise. So, like, one a couple of questions around that. How do you how do you standardize counseling so that you have five five patients and that you're delivering information in the same way, or do you tailor it according to that patient's you know perspective and you know your you know your relationship with that patient? Um, how do you how do you do that, and uh, and what are the strategies that um, clearly you've you've anticipated this as being an issue, so it's a challenge. How are you addressing that challenge? So we probably shouldn't tailor. That's the thing. When you start to tailor what you say, is when you start to get into problems because you will start to emphasize one thing over another, and so we probably should have essentially a script that we all have to follow, and and there are, there are models where our nursing colleagues actually do the counseling because they're probably better at it than we are because they're not doing the treatments they won't emphasize certain words which you do subconsciously um, the qualitative work helps so we try to do it it's, it the protect has done it as well is to try and interview people as you go through to see what their experiences are and try and embed that in to your counseling recordings videos scripts probably has to be done for such difficult studies, the people offering the study need to be all trained to do it. It's not always easy to express equipoise. So I think those are things we tried, um, and those, that's what I would, would urge people to do if you're running one of these studies. Because you want to have a, you want to complete, you want to actually finish the trial. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful talk and, uh, and strong work for helping us push this forward. You mentioned uh, the, the issues with availability. You know, is there an opportunity, especially under kind of generalized database IRBs or kind of doing more focal IRBs that we as community physicians could potentially use to try to recruit patients into these studies in the United States? Because 
access to focal therapy and different technologies is not quite as easy from a financial aspect here because very few things are actually completely covered. So that could potentially open up the possibility of doing studies like this with a little bit more um, ease of negotiation or discussion with the patient because the ability to just go somewhere else and do it without significant cost out of pocket uh, could be eliminated. And that could be a positive way for collaboration across the pond, if you will, or taking ideas that you have and, and bring them to fruition here for, with recruitment strategies. Yeah, I agree. I think go to all these the smaller hospitals where they, they are at least they're seeing the patients first. They're probably the, 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 the ideal person to offer a new clinical trial. It's a, yeah, it's about local ethics, how you set it up. And in the UK, we're fortunate. We have a completely nationalized, socialized system. We ha it's really slow, but we have the ability to open any hospital as a trial site. We also have the ability to open hospitals as something called a pick site, where they can essentially, they, don't, they can find the patients for you as well. It's slow going. It does need a bit of funding. But again, being nationalized, there are... We, we can pull from those pots. So it depends. I don't understand the, the U.S. structure for how you fund a center. We don't quite understand it much here either. <laughs> so if you could open, you could do it on a per patient basis. Could you recruit 10 or 20? And suddenly you're fine with, with 20, 30 hospitals across because you're a big country. You suddenly have hundreds no, of something patients. to open up to the leadership here. Is there something where we can work together to create you know, IRBs and things of that mm -hmm. nature might make it easier for us, even people that treat a lot or people that can recruit into places that treat a lot? Because I think that's a great opportunity. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, you ought to be congratulated for uh, designing and conducting these trials. It's an extraordinary amount of work, and thank God you're young. Uh, but do you think it's possible in these trials to answer one unanswered question for the patients? Which is, uh, you know, we just completed a meta-analysis, all Sonoblade Haifu done 2001 to 2022 worldwide. Mm. And worldwide, the freedom from progression to radical therapy, well, I'll rephrase it, progression to radical therapy is 16.8% worldwide. So we can pat ourselves on the back for the roughly 84%. But you're still left with that 16.8%, and now they're getting radical therapy. So what those patients want to know is, if I get my radical therapy at that point, am I getting equivalent results to the radical therapy if I had just picked it first? Because if we can show that that's true, then that's, a, to me, a big win for focal therapy. If we can say, if you do not succeed, and you get a second bite of the apple, your final result is the same. I think that would be a big win for patients and for focal therapy. And if you look at what's out there, and Professor Stricker you know, stood up, and he showed yesterday uh, salvage radical prostatectomy after IRE at a 53%, I think, uh, PT3 rate. When we looked at it for Sonoblade Hyphus in our series, is 43%. These are higher than de novo radical prostatectomies. So I guess the final question is, can you incorporate this into trial where it doesn't end with uh, they proceeded to uh, radical therapy, but it moves a little further out to what were the results of that radical therapy? Yeah. And in the part trial, you could actually compare that. So part's a good design for that. And there's other designs. You have to keep the follow-up going beyond that event, that, 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 that essentially the, 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 um, the failure event. The, so it's a completely valid point. We should collect all of that data for patients who had radical treatment afterwards, whether it's prostatectomy or radiotherapy, to see what their outcomes were, and then allow us to compare. Some of the longer-term outcomes are possible. We, uh, you've got can cancer registries in the US. We've got cancer registries in the UK. There is a way to link patients within clinical trials to these registries, so we can get mortality. We can't get metastases because it's not coded very well. But we can get failure and survival at 10 years, 15, 20 years. It just takes time after the trial is finished to get that data. And as with all things, it costs money. So the cost per year of running a trial is usually hundreds of thousands of pounds. And this will be the same here. And that's the issue is, is will the funder accept additional years of follow-up? In some studies they have. Protec they did, and again, Professor Hamdi could have spoken about it, it cost, I think, tens of millions of pounds to get that study done. But it, you do need to get that money from somewhere to keep the, the infrastructure running. Um, yeah, <clears throat> again, commit, 
congratulations on the talk. But th there are two aspects. Um, why? The first question is uh, just a technical one. Uh, why do you have to have equal numbers in the two arms? I mean, there's so many things where you've got 40 in the radical prostatectomy arm and 200 in the focal therapy arm. And, and maybe, and, and just tell me how you power that. Uh, but the other question is, um, and, and I presented it in one of the talks, was uh, the work we did with Madeline uh, Smith, where, where we looked at what people are prepared to trade. And as part of the counselling, before they even get interviewed to be randomised, if they're prepared to trade massively for quality of life, and, and that's their bias before they start, we're going to save ourselves a lot of time because having a standardised piece of information in a person who's going to trade a quality of life for length of life, it's a waste of time. Yep. And do those type of trading questions ever come into the screening process? They, um, they do, but not as, as, uh, um, uh, as formalised as that. They should, I agree. And that's what all of this was. Is a lot of these trials, patients need to have equipoise, but you can't find that out until you approach them and go through it all and then you find out they don't. But you're right, maybe we should have some filter questions right at the beginning. Would you even accept this randomization? What are you prepared to trade? And that might make it easier you're still going to need a lot of patients because the same number of patients are going to say no. We might just need to put in less work to get there. Yeah. Um, and in terms of uneven randomization, it's completely fair. It's a way to try and improve acceptance of a study. It may not remove the number of patients who refuse the control arm, but you can have one to two, one to three. It does change your sample size. And you, sit, I, you have to sit down with a statistician to do it. There are pros and cons to doing it. So it increases the chance of you getting focal, two out of three, let's say. And that's actually why Kronos B did so well. Everyone got focal in all the arms. So they were happy. But yes, you can. Cool. Thank you.